Hello there and welcome to the show. The Phil Hayes Show is brought to you by The Athletic and The Square Ball. You can get in touch with the show via the new Twitter account at The Phil Hayes Show. You can catch us now on YouTube if you want to look at The Athletic UK channel and uh, you can catch us on all the usual audio platforms as well. I'm Dan Moyland. No Michael Normanson this week. I think... Uh, He's crying off somewhere, so instead we've got this guy, Phil Hay. Hello. I, I was asking you beforehand, is, is Norman Tenille after standing undercover watching other square ball sellers in the rain? It was rather wet at the weekend, wasn't it? We will get into all that in due course. And with the football season all kicked off again now, you can subscribe to The Athletic to read everything of Phil's that is on there. Uh, loads of Premier League coverage, sport from around the world, all the essential sports stories that matter. 33% off the price of a full subscription at theathletic.com forward slash Leeds pods a good week in store on the athletic then phil talk to me there's a piece on for show which i think people will be pretty interested in just um you know explaining a lot of what's gone on with him and, and how it's actually been for him through through two years away with injury um i've also written about the transfer window it's been a bone of contention hasn't it this year um so a bit of an explanation as to what's been going on why it is what it is um and why in, in my view it's not um a huge problem uh, but clearly minus a central midfielder it hasn't quite gone to plan either well, let's get into that then, shall we? Let's start on transfers because the window closes in the next, uh, well, under the next week. So this time next week when we speak, it'll all be done and dusted. Will you be looking forward to the window closing, Phil? Very much so, although I'm going to use the Angus Kinnear defence of nobody really saw Rafinha coming until the very last minute in, in the last window, so you you never say never. But it's been, it's been a difficult window to cover in the sense that there have only been two deals of note. There's been... Um, Junior Firpo in from Barcelona which is going to be the, the big signing when this window closes um, I would assume and there has been um, Christopher Klassen as well the goalkeeper from Norway but given that Klassen was coming in a second choice to a very good and, and very promising number one in, in Ilan Melier that was never going to have a, an immediate impact Firpo is the one here and now who should be making the difference to the team and Firpo is the one here and now who represents I guess the only change to the, the Bielsa framework that was there last season and, and did so well in the Premier League, and did there's no there's no doubt that they wanted a, a centre mid, and there's no doubt that they've wanted a centre mid for a while. You know that um, from the, the the closeness that that they how close they came to getting um, Michael Quisons from Bayern Munich last summer. That was a, a good medical and a successful medical away from going through for about eighty million pounds. It's not a secret that they bid for Conor Gallagher down at Chelsea and we'd absolutely have taken him if Gallagher hadn't gone to Palace and, and not a secret either that they've been in for Lewis O'Brien at Huddersfield Town. And they do have Adam Forshaw coming up on the rails and Forshaw had, I thought, a, a very good comeback on Tuesday, really encouraging comeback. Um, but it, it is a position that they wanted to strengthen and it is a position that they, they intended to strengthen. But unless we see some wriggle room with Huddersfield on the valuation, I, I don't see that one happening. For sure. Are we going to use a Batesism and say he's like a new signing? Yeah, I, he, he kind of is, really. I, I think in this case you can make this argument in, in the sense that it's not like he's been out for two months or three months. He, he hasn't been seen at all for two years. And if you get for sure in prime form and prime fitness, then actually he's a, he's a big asset and he's a player who Bielsa clearly, clearly knows how he wants to use and, and clearly does want to use. You know, I think he would love to have him at, at his disposal regularly. And I think you could see on Tuesday the way in which from time to time he definitely helps in that zone in front of Calvin Phillips. You know, the kind of mix of eight-stroke tens that, that Bielsa likes. I, I can definitely see how Forshaw will fit. The, 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 the issue with him, and we're going to talk about him in length in, in part two, but the issue with him is whether or not he's going to stay fit and whether or not he's going to be up to speed in the Premier League, and whether or not he's going to be able to make the right sort of impression. And if he is, great. And if he is, I, I think suddenly the, the need for a centre mid becomes you know, less severe. If he isn't able to make um, that sort of impression, then it, there is the risk of again being found short in that area and of, of lacking you know, just the extra body that you do need. And I think I would feel more comfortable, without worrying about the squad particularly, I think I would feel more comfortable had you know Gallagher arrived or, or O'Brien arrived, A, because of the players that Bielsa clearly liked and, and wanted, but B, because it just would have given you that variety and that choice for, for parts where players are missing. I do feel, I mean, we're retreading old ground here, I do feel though that maybe they've sold themselves a little bit short, whether that's uh, due to financial constraints, whether that's down to Bielsa being ultra picky, I'm not quite sure. And um, The argument 
for that, I think, I mean, I should say I want to caveat this by saying I wasn't at Crew, but um, from all the reports, and we'll get into it now, you tell me, um, the fringe players who were trying to push into this side, did they do enough, um, in your opinion, in the Crew game to put themselves in contention for the first team? And, and does it show that there is enough depth in the squad? Somebody like Forshaw, yes, and I think you have to consider him a fringe player given that he's, he hasn't played for so long. Um, I am starting to think that, that Llorente is the best centre-back at the club and, and felt that way for a little while now. And some of his passing on Tuesday was, was exemplary. I mean, so good out from the back. The the long balls that he's able to pick from, from a really, really long range. Um, less so Rodrigo, who... Uh, it, the, the experiment of him at 10 is has me in two minds because there were points last season where it was good particularly towards the end of the season and, and that little run where you know he was he was getting in the team he was getting goals he, he was looking looking better and um, at times playing up front as a nine as well there, there was the mix made you hope and made you think that he was starting to acclimatize and and that he was he, he was going to feel his way into this team properly we haven't really seen it from him um, so far in, in the two games that he's played he, he didn't get in amongst it at all at, at Old Trafford I didn't feel and it was a battle for him again on Tuesday to make a proper impression. Um, and I just, I go back to what was said about him at Valencia. He, he he was considered to be a very versatile player. But actually, if you looked at properly at where he played, and our, our stats guy Tom Warble did some really good analysis of this, he was a nine more often than not. And, and he could be quite a mobile nine. He could drift out wide. He could do, you know, quite a bit of what, what Bamford does. But he was essentially a centre forward. I think that's how he, he saw himself, a, a striker and a, and a goal scorer. So whether that's going to work is becoming increasingly difficult to tell. And at the moment, it doesn't really feel again like it, it is clicking. I thought Costa had a disappointing night on Tuesday as well. A little bit like Crawley away last season, the kind of game where you'd really do expect somebody like Costa to be able to shine and to thrive. It wasn't his night. And I thought Harrison was considerably better on the other side of the pitch. I thought there was a noticeable difference um, as soon as Bamford came, on to, came off the bench. And it has to be said that in Bamford, you can see a swagger and an arrogance and a confidence that wasn't always there with him, but it's definitely there with him now. I think he feels as settled as he ever has as a, you know, as a top level striker. And, and he, 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 he just tore crew to shreds in the period that he was on the pitch. Um, so have they done enough? Some of them are, are clearly able to contribute and some of them clearly are going to contribute. I think around the fringes there are still question marks over people and I, and I think Costa in particular and the, the suggestion that at some stage Leeds might go for another winger I, I think is, to be honest, justified by Costa's form at the moment. Just returning to Rodrigo momentarily, where was he playing on Tuesday against Crew? Because I saw some anecdotal reports that he was playing at number 10 there and Roberts was up front or were they interchanging or, or was he in the number 9 position? He was in behind Roberts. They were they were trying to be fluid, um, and they were trying to to mix it up as best they can. And I think in a game like that, as much as Crew were defending very deeply, where when when they weren't in possession, and, and you were expecting that, you still thought that the quality of somebody like Rodrigo would have would have shone through in in the way that it did for Harrison, in in the way that it did for Bamford when he came on. I just I, I was looking at Rodrigo's body language, and there were periods in the game where you could feel it not working for him you could feel it not quite happening there wasn't really any magic um in in his game and it did make me think whether you know made, made me sort of question whether or not he's kind of dying for a run up front which let's be honest just isn't going to come at the moment because Bamford is the nine the system is what it is 4-1-4-1 it, it it you know it rotates around one centre forward which has always been Patrick Bamford and um, for as long as we can remember now so it's difficult and essentially you've got a 27 million pound player who isn't in his preferred position and, and isn't really shining at the moment. And they've they've got to make more of you know they've they've got to make that one work at that price. He's 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 got to come into his own. Dare we ask if Ollie Watkins might have been the more prudent signing out of the two? I mean, easy to say with hindsight. I I watched Watkins quite a bit at Brentford because um, Leeds Leeds obviously were, were tussling with them quite a lot in the Championship, and I always liked him and and I always rated him, but I'm not sure that he's any more of a hybrid eight stroke 10 than Rodrigo I think if you know if if Watkins had his way he would want to play up front ideally in a in a three or, or out wide in a, a three but I don't think he would necessarily favor that midfield position which you know you, you need a lot of um attacking quality there 
But you need to have a defensive brain as well in, in Bielsa's team. You've got to have defensive input alongside what you do going forward with the ball. So would Watkins at 30 million have been any more effective? Perhaps he would have had a better run and perhaps he would have stayed fitter than um, Rodrigo has through the 12 months. But in behind Bamford... I'm not really sure that either would have fitted better than the other. Um, I think both would have come in and hoped that they would have been the centre forward or would have been roughly in, in that sort of position. So it would be easy to say that on the basis that they got Rodrigo in and didn't say Watkins, but I honestly think the jury's out on that one. The other side to that, though, is that Rodrigo is now 30 and Watkins is a, a lot younger than that, so you get more shelf life from him. But that's not to say that I'm writing off Rodrigo just yet. And we'll, I'm sure we'll speak more of him um, as the season wears on and we get more of an impression about where his form is heading but I don't I, know, I, it, it, just, to, just to say as well like I get the feeling with him that when he finds form and, and when he gets on a bit of a roll it probably stays with him for quite a while I could imagine in you know suddenly in five or six weeks time feeling that he's hugely influential suddenly and, and he's he's got himself going but he certainly isn't there at the moment and I think the point you make about age is a good one in relation to how much they need to try and make of him because at that at that age you expect a footballer to be in the peak you expect them to make a a, a quick and, and concerted impact and and he has had injuries and he has had covid so it didn't help in season one but given that we're into season two now you you do want to see him come to the fore Let's talk about Ian Pervader then quickly, because he's gone to Blackburn on loan. It seems to be the general feeling that when you go on loan, you're kind of done at Leeds at the minute. If Bielsa's, if you're not in Bielsa's favour, then it's the end of the road that's coming one way or another. But he's coming back in a year's time. It's certainly been the case. The, the 23s who go out on loan or the younger players who go out on loan are sent on loan because Bielsa has no expectation that they're going to even knock on the door of the first team and he doesn't particularly want them in the emerging talent group because that is reserved for the players who he thinks are closest so your Robbie Gotts and your Alfie McCalmonts as, as soon as they started to move you began to think to yourself that's probably the end of the line for them here certainly if, if Bielsa is head coach long term there has been a slight softening in that I think the club have tried to to say to Bielsa there is actually some merit in, in getting games for players who aren't that close and it seems apparent that, that Paveda isn't close now you know he's he's clearly gone backwards I would just say as well there's been a lot of talk about a fallout with Bielsa and several people at the club have, have said to me that it's not like that you know it, it that isn't the, the kind of basis for this he, he just is a long way from the first team some of it all seems to have seems to have come past him um, and be ahead of him in in the pecking order there is no option in the Blackburn deal um whether so you you can assume on that basis that they haven't written him off completely but I think it's going to be a long way back for him. He's going to have to have a very good year at, at Blackburn and then make, you know, very much hit the ground running when he comes back if he's going to get back into the into the picture here. Um, you, your gut feeling is that it might be over for Paveda, but they, that statement when they released him and the comments from um, from Otter as he went on loan to, to Blackburn definitely, definitely left the door open for a, another opportunity. It's just we've seen in the past that when this happens, there doesn't tend to be one waiting. And to be ultra pragmatic about it, if he goes to the, the championship and does a good job, you might end up recouping a few million quid for him, in which case it's a, a good deal all round. Absolutely. And Liverpool liked what Blackburn did with Harvey Elliott um, last season. They're actually very big on sending players over to Blackburn. They like the way they're managed there. They think um, that Mowbray, Mowbray's a good good manager to work under. It's just a, a decent setup to, to bring them on. And you're right, Paveda should have some resale value. He, he he is a player who who should earn you a fee of sorts. When you speak to people, and I, I chatted to people who knew him at Brentford um, and, and a few other places, they, they talk of him having immense talent, you know, real obvious natural ability and, and loads of flair as well. One of those kind of natural wingers. Uh, but it needs to... It needs to click, you know. It needs to come together. He he needs to he needs to get himself a run of games, which I'm sure he, he will do over at Blackburn. Um, but you know, as I say, you you got feeling tends to be that if he's going over there, then he's he's a long way from the picture under Bielsa. To the football side of things, then, and uh, nice to get that first win of the season under the belt, albeit against uh, Crew, who made it look quite difficult. I mean, looking from the outside, like I say, I stress I, I wasn't there. Um, had other family commitments, which were fun. Uh, but we dealt with them in the end, the fitness told. Um, and as you said, when Bamford came on, it, it made the difference. But it was important to win. It was, and it was a much stronger lineup. Uh, we did sort of press Bielsa on that afterwards. You know, why, given his previous lineups in 
in the Cups. And it's it's funny because his league record is so good. I mean, his win ratio is so high. And set against it, his Cup record is absolutely abysmal. Um, and Leeds have never looked like doing anything in the Cups. And have had, you know, some pretty, pretty torrid defeats, particularly Crawley last season. It, it was a strong side, but Bielsa was saying afterwards, it was strong because I felt that there were players who needed minutes. You know, you had Urenti was coming back from his, his muscle pool. Um, you had players like Costa in there and Roberts who hadn't played a, a great deal more minutes for Rodrigo, for sure, obviously. Um, and he made it sound as if the, the two things had just collided. You know, the game had come along and actually there was a, a strong side that needed to, to get a game and, and that was the reason why. He, he certainly wasn't giving us the impression that he'd done it because Crawley had been a bit of a humiliation or perhaps he'd, he'd got it wrong in previous games. But you you always felt it was coming against Crew, even though it, it all came quite late in the end. There were so many chances, particularly the Phillips header in the first half. Um, and they're kind of funny games, these, because they're, it's, it's not as if they're inconsequential, but they just never feel as serious as the league games. With the league games, everything matters, everything's, everything's tense, everything's a frustration when it doesn't go wrong. With these, you're able to sit back a little bit more and, and almost enjoy the chances that are, that are going begging and, and flying by. But... Bamford off the bench, just it, 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 it. Crew was starting to tire. He did exactly the right thing by dragging them in all directions, and they just could not cope with the movement um, and the and and basically the the intensity of the onslaught. Uh, and I always thought it was going to tell, and and it's a good job that it did because that was not a game you wanted to let go to penalties. Not like Bamford had fun against Everton at the weekend as well, getting in a bit of a tear up constantly with the uh, with Mina. He, he looks to me like, as I say on on Tuesday, I thought there was a total swagger in his play which I absolutely love and it's easier to be like that when you've got goals to back it up with as well and I know it, it's not as if he's been on a, a massive role this season but he's got plenty behind him in, in the last two seasons and I always say this but I, I think Bielsa's management of him, Bielsa isn't a man manager in the sense that he doesn't often get you know get his arm around players and doesn't really have any personal relationship with them at all. He, he is a good man manager in the sense that he makes players improve they see the benefit and because of that they like his management it's not touchy-feely but I do think with Bamford it's been very very clever in that he has always always backed him and he's never I, I can only think of one period where and that was when Nketiah was here where, where Bielsa was minded to drop Bamford other than that when Bamford's been fit he has always stuck with him and I just think little by little it's brought Bamford's confidence out um, it, it's brought out his I think his belief that he is a Premier League striker and should be a Premier League striker, uh, and it was even though it was against Crew, it was a it was a terrific performance, and it was actually for anybody coming up as a young centre forward, it was a classic example I think of how centre forwards have to play these days, which is not hover in the six yard box, it's get around the pitch and and do damage outside the box. You look at Bamford's progress, and he's gone from being a player who frustrated in the Championship uh, to really laying down a marker last year and now it feels like he's one of the first names on the team sheet you'd have him in every time wouldn't you i think there's another side to it as well which was that in the championship th th there was always this kind of lingering atmosphere of people thinking is this guy good enough you know do, is this guy going to get us promoted are we going to get to the end of the season and think if we'd had i don't know ivan tony up front or or if we'd had a, a prolific forward um in attack would it have been different? Would we have um, finished top two? Would we have won the league? Would we have not lost in, in the playoffs? But because his goals you know, made such a big difference and then again were there in the Premier League, that it's kind of eradicated that argument and it has justified Bielsa's faith in him. I, I always think back to the, the January transfer window in the promotion season when Alter was trying to push Billy Sharp and Glenn Murray Bielsa's way and was, was saying, you know, look, look, these guys will score you goals. They might not be perfect for you, but you can see from the records that they will probably chip in with a bunch. And um, Bielsa just said, well, but they're not Bamford. You know, they don't do what Bamford does. They don't play like he does. Therefore, not interested. Get that list out of my sight. Um, I don't think it was quite like that. <laughs> but uh, it, was a, it was a case of, you know, conversations over. When we're not signing either of those two. And as I say, I, I, I think it's had a huge impact on Bamford. And, and he's one of several players who I, I suspect will look back at the end of his career and think that these years were the best of it. When it comes to first names on team sheets, would you put him top or probably Calvin Phillips, wouldn't you? And his return against Everton, I think, was fairly instrumental in the shape of that game. Yeah, I had an email actually through the week which was saying that they, they thought we went a bit too heavy in the last podcast on the Phillips absence at Old Trafford. And they, they were trying to make the point that other players were poor um, over at Manchester United. And I think that's valid to say. I, I, don't, I wouldn't 
um, argue with that at all. But I think if you look at the nature of the goals, the, there was a definite problem in that area, no doubt about it. I didn't think they co coped with Fernandez at all. And and more to the point, the wider organisation didn't do anything to constrain Pogba, which you absolutely have to do. You can't give him free free reign to pass. It was very different against Everton. It wasn't perfect. The, you know, there was a period in the second half where I felt it was getting away from Leeds. The Koury was starting to get into that little pocket around Leeds' box. They were getting stretched at the back. There were two big, big chances for Calvert-Lewin, which at 2-1 down, I think, would have settled the game if he'd scored either of those. One particularly good save from, from Melier. But Leeds deserved a point from that. There's no doubt at all. And I think that's a really good point against a decent Everton side, not a marquee Everton side, but they have a lot of good players. And I do think, again, this comes back to sort of realistic expectation. A year after promotion, if you're expecting to turn over Everton at Ellen Road, I think you're asking a little bit too much. They're a team you can beat, no question at all. But it is always going to be tight and it is always going to be really competitive. And I, the game was strangely low quality in parts, but almost better for it. It was niggly and it was a proper battle. Loved it. I enjoyed it immensely. Yeah. I, I, I honestly think it's one of my favourite Leeds games, that. for Partly because of the crowd, no doubt about that. But also because it felt like it felt like proper Premier League football. You could you had two clubs there who would argue the toss about which is bigger than the other, but would accept that they, they can probably understand why the other side would, would argue in their favour. It was a proper banging of heads. There was no attempt to invent a sort of, you know, imaginary rivalry for the sake of the 90 minutes. It's, it's, it's proper kind of locking of horns. And it was a very, very good contest. Um, and I thought the result was about right in the end. Yeah, I would agree with that. It felt to me like walking away from it, Everton fans, and we looked at the Everton fan channels on our podcast, Square Ball podcast, like the propaganda one, and they were all of a mind to say, probably should have won it based on when they were 2-1 up and Calvert-Lewin missed those chances. But uh, when it comes down to it, happy to take a point and a good point for both sides. And it felt like, um, reflecting on that, I think um, we benchmarked ourselves against an absolutely rock-solid Premier League side there and said, we're probably about on that same level. Which I think is where Leeds would want to be and realistically where you can ask them to be. I think there's every chance that they finish above Everton. I think there's every chance that they finish below Everton as well. I think realistically they should be in the same sort of ballpark because I don't think that's an Everton team who are going to make a significant difference to the league. I don't think they're going to get into Europe this season, but I would expect them to be roughly roughly top half. And the atmosphere around it as well, it... it one of the one of the best moments on Saturday for me, I felt, was the support that was given to the taking of the knee um, at at kickoff, and it might we, we had that again on Tuesday, and which is great, but obviously over time it becomes habitual and people get into the habit of doing it. On Saturday, people tell me there was a little bit of booing to begin with. Now I couldn't hear that; I wasn't audible from the press box, but they say that 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 happened. I felt that the support for that was so instinctive that if you were a player, you would know for certain that the crowds on mass are with you um, and I think it's important for players to know that there's been a huge amount said about the, the taking of the knee and, and I always felt sympathy for Phillips when he, he was away with England at the Euros that some of the earliest interviews that he had to do as an England player and as a you know player who was involved in the, the European Championships were focusing on the issue of the knee you had Southgate defending it you had the players trying to explain it and you know it, I, I know Phillips, and he won't mind me saying this, that I don't think at night he's sitting around reading about Marxism or extreme left-wing politics. He, he, he says it's an anti-racism message, and I totally believe him as I do with the rest of the players. And I kind of feel that if you if you like Phillips and if you respect Phillips and if you see him as, as this Yorkshire pillow and everything else, then you should understand what he's saying and you should accept what he's saying. And I know there are people out there who totally oppose the taking of the knee, and that's their opinion. I don't agree with it at all. One of the things I have even more of an issue with is, and I did have a few messages like this, is people who say to me, how long is this going to go on for? As if footballers get a finite amount of time to deal with a problem that's existed since the dawn of time. As if you're saying to them, look, we'll tolerate you making these protests but only for a, only for this period, you know. If you can just solve racism within the next three or four weeks, and well, then we can all move on. It should, that'd be, be done, great. should be done by Christmas. Should well, racism? I, I, absolutely. Um, it's a it's a constant battle, and if you see the the Instagram messages that get sent to players and to people like Ian Wright as well, it's absolutely appalling. And it's not 
football's problem. It's society's problem, but it is there in football. And I just, I, I just thought if you were a player on the pitch and you were wondering in your head, and there must be this kind of consideration, are the supporters with us in this or, or are they are they not? I, I think in that moment you, you had your answer and they must have felt so much better for it. I think for me, it's about being on the right side of history as well. Because um, I, I was in the East Stand, there was some fairly loud, audible booing. And then it just took that half second for people to register what was going on. And then the applause and, and the cheering for it drown it out very, very quickly. And it felt like people were saying, like, you know, what do we want to stand for here? The, the right side of this or, or the wrong side of it? And I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm not convinced by the whole the Marxism argument either. It, feel, it feels like a, a distraction from, from the underlying point. But um, it, it did feel like a marker was thrown down there as well. People saying, you know, we want to be we want to be on the right side of this. But aside from that, I wouldn't want to dwell solely on that. The atmosphere was brilliant. Um, yeah. And I was saying in the piece that I wrote afterwards that it was like the, you talk about the seven stages of grief. It's like the seven stages of watching Leeds, the point where they come out the tunnel and you think, here we go. Um, and then, the, you know, the, the opening five, ten minutes, his players are turning into each other and Richarlison gets taken out. But then inevitably, the, the penalty that Cooper gives away and, you know, the tension of VAR and then the despair when it when the penalty is awarded and Everton score and then Leeds equalise and Everton score again. It felt like Ellen Road, as you absolutely knew it, you know, I was saying in the piece, you kind of sell a bit of your nervous system every time you, you go in there and it really hasn't changed. But it was it was a wonderful afternoon. We mentioned Adam Forshaw in the first part there then Phil and two years out which is it's a phenomenal amount of time normally you expect that to be something like a hideous leg break or a big knee injury where you have a recurrence but I don't think any of us have really ever got to the bottom of what kept Adam Forshaw out but I've I've read the article that, that you've done about this and we're getting into the realms of having teeth taken out in order to make himself better it's been a fairly wild ride for him hasn't it? It makes me think of the 1980s when I first started watching football and when players got serious injuries, they could disappear for what felt like forever. I, Craig Levine was one of my favourite players at, at Hearts, really, really quality centre-back. And I think it was knee ligaments that he did, I would have been seven or eight. And I can't remember exactly how long he was out for, but it felt like in, in an indefinite amount of time. And, and you could almost imagine how injuries like that would rule somebody out for ages or would potentially finish a career. These days, you don't think of too many injuries as being career-threatening because the medical treatment is is so good. Um, and neither Forshaw nor anybody at Leeds would deny that this has been an extraordinarily long recovery process. It's been massively frustrating. I think one of the things that it makes you realise is that the, the, these, are always, these situations are always looked at in two ways. On the outside and amongst supporters and to, to an extent journalists as well, the thing you concentrate on is the absence of any impact on them, uh, from them, you know, any impact on the team, the fact that they're never playing, they're never able to contribute anything, the fact that it feels like it's a wage that's being carried in return for you know, not in return for nothing in, in a football sense, and it's all seen through the prism of what's good for the, the club. But on the flip side, you've got the, the question of what is this actually doing to the player? What is, it, what is it like for the player himself? And a lot of people will probably have seen Forshaw's Instagram message after the friendly at Geisley, where he was pictured with his son, and he was saying, my son, who looked to me to be four, something like that, three, four years old, said, my son would have no recollection at all of watching me play, because for most of his life, I haven't. You know, I haven't been in the team, I haven't been in the squad, I haven't been close to it. He wouldn't know that I'm a footballer, really. I can tell him I'm a footballer, but I never play, so so where's the, the evidence? And over time, I've kind of come to see Forshaw as a, a real model professional in the sense that it's never been enough for him to sit and take his money, and it's never been enough for him to say, well, I'm 30 and I've had years in the game, so, you know, this is just the way it is. This has been horrendous for him, and it's been a constant battle of thinking I'm just about there I'm just about there uh, the hip and the groin's hurting again I'm going to have a bit more time off never quite getting himself back um, and I, I watched him as he came out the tunnel on uh, on Tuesday night and I thought he looked like a kid he looked so happy and he was bouncing about on the pitch and you could just tell how much it meant to him to be to be back in the thick of it and I was extremely pleased for him and I know for a fact there'll be a lot of medical people at Leeds who are extremely pleased for him as well because I got the sense a year or so back that this became a big battle of wills that nobody was prepared to lose in terms of that human side of it we used to see back in the olden days players would disappear off and then 
just come back or not come back. But these days, I think there's been such a clamour for information. We always want to know when he's back, when he's back, when he's back. But actually, he's been through a real personal hell himself. And talking of the olden days, so many players have said in years gone by that they've struggled with the transition out of the day-to-day -day stuff of football, like being around the mates, training. And you had COVID into this, where he's been probably isolating away from all the guys during his peak years. And it must have been really, really difficult for him. So it's no surprise that he's come back uh, grinning like a Cheshire cat. The people who spend most time or the players who spend most time at the training ground tend to be the players who are injured um, because the physios spend a lot of time working on them. Everybody else, and it is different under Bielsa because the training's so so hard and, and there's so much of it in analysis sessions and everything. But you do have regimes where players come in, train for an hour, hour and a half and, and, and then head off home. You are there more than anybody else, but as time goes on and if it's a long-term injury, you become certainly to the public more invisible and more anonymous. And you, you get stuck in that, I guess, brain scramble of, do you want people to speak about you or, or don't you? It's, you don't want to be forgotten. But at the same time, any discussion about Forshaw over the past two years on social media or in newspapers or online or whatever else was always going to be about where is he? When's he going to be back? Um, a lot of the updates would constantly be, he's doing okay, he's getting there, but you know, he's, he's got a long road, which generates this attitude of, we're never going to see him again. It's the jokes of, you know, who's going to be back before before Forshaw, which is all well and good, but not, not overly funny for him. And he'll understand that. And he knows people are only being, you know, light about it. He knows that there's a, a club you need to be competitive and, and everything else. But it, it, it is difficult. And, and I went back to the very start of this. He, he the, the problem was basically that he had a bone in his hip and a bone in his groin that were rubbing together. And it wasn't like much Leeds had seen before. And they thought for a long time that it was the sort of thing that they could probably manage and, and get him over. And, you know, over time, it would just cure itself if they did the right things with him. And he was certainly on board with that. But he suffered it in a, a pre-season game at, at Cowery. And he was missing from a game at Derby in September. And we said to Bielsa, um, you know, where's Forshaw? What's what's the situation with him? He had a bit of pain. Bielsa said, um, but he'll be back next week. And Forshaw was back next week. And he played in that game down at um, Charlton, end of September. So it, it was made to sound, and Leeds certainly thought, and Bielsa as well, it, it was made to sound that it was not anything serious and it was no big deal. And it was the kind of thing that would keep him out for a week, a couple of weeks, but then you'd, you'd never hear about it again. And suddenly you're 12 months on, suddenly you're two years on, suddenly they've gone from, we don't want him to go for surgery to we're sending him to the Stedman Clinic in Colorado because he needs the best treatment on this. That worked, but inevitably because he hadn't played a, at all, he had niggles, he had problems, joints and muscles were susceptible to strains and, and you know, th that sort of thing that, that happens to players on the way back. The tooth removal was... They have sort of free dentistry at Leeds and, and these days clubs look at absolutely everything. So there's basically no part of the body that they don't think about. But there are links between the health of your jaw and your teeth and the health of the rest of your body. And the, the people think that there are connections between the nerves in your gums and, you know, potentially injuries or pain in, in other parts of your body. So we had teeth removed. And, and that gives you a great example of not trying anything, but borderline trying anything. You know, getting to the stage of what else can we do to, to help this? And I, he's never said this. He hasn't done too much in the way of media. I hope at some point he will, because it would be nice to to hear his side of this and and how it's looked, you know, to him from, from really from the inside. But there must have been points where he thought to himself, "I don't know if I'm ever going to get over this. I, I don't know if I'm ever, or even if I do get over this, am I ever going to get back to the stage where I'm actually able to play properly and at a very high level?" And if you don't care about your career and if you're happy to take the money, then perhaps that doesn't matter. But that is not the case for him. And, and that will have been a huge, a huge concern for him and a massive weight on him. And not only that, you would imagine there's a point at which you lose the will to keep trying as well. And it's probably easier to take the insurance payoff and go, I don't know, play golf or, you know, see some, see some of your family sometime. That kind of thing. It must be, I've been really testing on his, just his, his willingness to stay in the game. But when you when you're gone, you're gone, and he is only thirty. And you know these days players play on way beyond thirty, and because of the way they're looked after and everything else, will probably be able to play on longer than ever before as as time goes on. I mean, it it was always quite telling though. Whenever I bumped into Rob Price, the head of medical at Leeds, I thought I would always ask about Forshaw, and he'd never give any state secrets away. 
but he was always optimistic about it and to the point of almost giving you the impression that they were gonna they were gonna win this however long it took and however hard it it was and they would quite often reference Eric Lamella down at Tottenham he had a hip injury and was out for I think 400 odd days in the end with that I don't know whether the the actual injury itself was similar but it was the same part of the body and I think what Lamella's comeback showed was that firstly you can get over something like that if you persevere with it um, and secondly that the comeback can be a concerted one you know you you can get back to the the level you were playing at before it's not as if you have to drop down a few levels or completely change the way you are you you can resume your career and that hopefully is how it's going going to go for for sure now i think the only caveat there is that we we're kind of talking about this on the back of one 60 minute performance which i thought was very good and i thought he didn't seem to be worried at all about getting into tackles or putting himself about but I think even he would like to have six months behind him before he can properly say you know adios to that and did he seem happy coming off the pitch then on uh, on Tuesday against the crew well the plan was 45 to 60 minutes um there was certainly no sign of him complaining about anything we asked Bielsa afterwards he seemed content it will definitely be a question for the press conference and um, when we see Bielsa before the Burnley game you know how is he um but if you see him in the squad on Sunday which ideally we we will I think you know that he's he's on he's on a much better track now and Rob Price has certainly earned his calm with this one, hasn't he, um, in terms of looking after him and just putting his well-being at the forefront of all this. Physios are fascinating people because professional football, especially these days, is so much about aspiration and attainment and it's all about performance in the games and results and everything else. And physios find themselves in this kind of questionable area where they have to they have to think about that and they have to concentrate on that and their job is ultimately to help produce the best first team you can but the priority is always the health and the well-being of the players and that's kind of that is almost without exception they would they would worry more about a player's health than they would about results which is exactly how how it has to be and that would be the case with with Forshaw Bielsa would probably have wanted Forshaw back at, at points um through these two years there might have been stages where Forshaw himself felt like he he was ready and I don't doubt that on occasions the medical team have probably had to say look you, you just need to lay off him or you ought to Forshaw himself you need to take it easy otherwise we're, we're going to have problems with this again you remember the 23s game he played in last season where he pulled a hamstring and again that was that that thing on on social media where and twitter where people were saying here we go again you know and i'm sure Forshaw would have been reading that thinking yeah here we do go again um but crucially it wasn't connected to the hip at the same time from what i gather Leeds said that on and the medical team said look forget about trying to rush him back for the West Brom game forget about you know the, the bonus that it would be if he could play in that if he's had basically two years out what are another couple of months get him back for pre-season let's do it properly let's make sure that he gets over this and from you know by all accounts he has had a very very good summer really strong summer he's coped with mother ball he's coped with the training sessions he's clearly fit enough in Bielsa's eyes to play and I, it does feel like he's back on the straight and narrow and I hope for his sake that he is that 23s game, that was Aston Villa, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, right towards the back end of the season where it seems like the aim was just to get him through it. If just to prove to him that he could do it. And then, because you think, you remember, he's he's been doing physio for basically a year and a half by that point. And they just said, look, just go on holiday and have a break from all this and spend some time with your family and just get ready for next season. Well, you know what it's like when you when you run for a while and you get yourself fit and healthy. No. Well, I was going to say, I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling to remember that as well, um, which is part of the, the point I'm about to make. You you go through, unless you're ultra committed to staying fit and healthy, you go through peaks and troughs where sometimes you are, other times you're, you're not, other times you're even worse than, than not. And I'm in this kind of worse than not stage at the moment. So I started running last week because I got the okay from the, the NT specialist. And... I'm miles away from what I was like when I was running properly. And before you do your first run, you always have it in your head. Am I even going to make it round this loop? You know, am I going to sort of, am I going to pull up halfway round? Am I going to die halfway round? What, what is it going to be like? And you do, you almost need to get through the barrier of being able to do it again to know for sure that you can. Um, and I think that'll have been the big thing for Forshaw on on Tuesday. It, they were talking about 45 minutes to 60 minutes. In the end, it was 60 minutes. So it was the full the full shebang um, as as was planned and unless we then unless there was something going on that we didn't notice he looked to be okay so end of the season his contract's up isn't it he's into his final year now and given the doubts around Bielsa maybe staying beyond the summer we never know from year to year what does the future hold for uh, for Adam Forshaw I think if he has a good season then 
and looks fit, then Leeds will be very tempted to extend his contract. I, th- I think they, they like him as a player, they like his attitude, they, they like his personality as well. I still think they feel that they've got a big asset there if he's fit and and if he's if he's ready to play longer term. If he has more injuries this season and, and if it doesn't go well and if it is as much of a problem as the last two years, then I think I'll... You know, realistically, you, you'd expect him to be released at the end of this deal. But I think he definitely has a chance to to get himself an extension. And I don't doubt as well that if he is fit enough to take an extension, he would want to take one here. We spoke about VAR there in part one, Phil. Um, it worked better against Everton, I would argue, even though we came out on the wrong side of it. I would like for it to have given us a penalty and not them. I thought it got it right on both fronts, to be honest. I did think... Cooper on Calvert-Lewin was a penalty. I thought that at the time, actually, when I saw it. And I, I kind of bang on about this a bit. But I think that's a decision that the referee should be able to see in plain sight. I, I, those decisions concern me slightly, not because they end up being right in the end, but because I th- it feels sometimes as if the referees are using VAR as a massive safety net now. Just let things go and then hopefully the video will pick it up. I, I thought that should have been easy enough to spot. The Bamford and Mina one was worthy of review, definitely. I felt that when it came to it, Mina was just a little bit stronger. Uh, And I can understand that people would um, interpret that differently. I think ultimately, if the referee doesn't give that, that is not going to be awarded as a clear and obvious error. Um, So the the decision is going to stand. But there are still little aspects of VAR which confuse me. And and I I still kind of doubt that the application of it is 100% um, consistent. But it, it... it wasn't so much of a problem at the weekend, let's say that. I do accept, I think, that that was a penalty, even though they were both at it, him and Calvert-Lewin, but Calvert-Lewin gave it up in just enough time for Cooper to be the one left holding the shirt. And the fact is, he got the wrong side of him, so immediately it looks bad. Does any, If that is at the other end of the field, does anybody come out of Ellen Road going, nah, it's just that, you know, they were both at it, really. You definitely want a penalty if that's your, your team. I thought it was. Right, on to, uh, to Burnley then. We've got that one coming up at the weekend. We are speaking ahead of Marcelo Bielsa's uh, press conference. That's going to be on Friday. So, uh, what can we look forward to? 4-4-2, 1-11. Deitch has been up to that recently. Yes, I would have thought so. Um, I guess there's a possibility that what happened at Tough Moor last season might get into his head and might make him think again about how to, to line up. But I think in a very different way. I, I, I never get the impression that that Dyche is influenced too much by what other sides are doing. I think he's very much got his plan, which he he sticks to at Burnley. Um, I didn't actually see this game last season. I watched highlights of it um, on on Y Scout, but I was kind of in the mix of um, of recovering from from surgery, so I wasn't. I didn't watch it from start to finish. I caught some of it, but but not the whole thing. But by all accounts, in the flesh, played very very well there, very well. I thought we were absolutely brilliant. Yeah, at Turf, one of the best of the season, but. The caveat there being there was nothing really at stake at that point. No, it was indicative, I thought, of the fact that Leeds carried on like a train to the very end of the line. Uh, a lot of other sides seemed to be pulling up. Um, or, you, you could say, just weren't able to live with that that impetus at that stage of the season. And uh, they, they were one of the form team, team's leads, and they won that game very, very convincingly. A lot of good goals in it as well. Um, strong performance. So, I would say that from the first month of the season and I cannot believe we're about to spill into another international break but we are um, I I always felt looking at the fixtures that Old Trafford would be difficult you wanted a more competitive performance over there but it would it was likely to be, be a defeat I felt. Everton was winnable um, but you would take a point because it was probably going to be the game that, that materialised the Ellen Road. Burnley I think was the first one where you wanted to see Bielsa Ball proper come to the, the fore that flare back, the, the imagination and, and the dominance um, as well, I think this is a pretty key key weekend and, and a key game, and I don't doubt that the players will be looking at this as a, a game they very much want to win. Do you think it increases the pressure in that regard? Had we beaten Everton, then it might have just calmed the nerves a little bit. That's not to say that anybody's particularly nervous, but like you say, you do look at this one and think, well, because we've had one point out of two games there, this is the one we have to do this really because. It goes back to the example of last season. We have to beat the teams below us. Yeah, I don't think it does increase the pressure because the point is a good one and uh, against Everton and you have to be fair and realistic about that. But these are the games that uh, these are the games that please people if you win. These are the games that automatically pose questions if you don't. Again, it's it would be too early in the season to draw any vast conclusions from it. And 
I always say this, but you, you know, 10 games in, you get a proper feel for how it's going um, and a proper feel for the levels of performance and, and the quality that Leeds are showing. And, and I guess overall, the amount of momentum they've got, it's very difficult to, to, you know, to properly gauge that after three games. And as I say, it seems ridiculous that the season is about to, to grind to a halt for two weeks already. But Burnley, I think, are a team who are going to finish bottom six. Um, I'd be surprised if they're they're much higher than that. I think there's potential for them to get into more trouble again. So yeah, Leeds need to be beaten beaten aside like this, and particularly given the way they turned them over, you know, back in May. It doesn't feel like a particularly happy place, Burnley, at the minute. It feels like the momentum that they got, you know, in the seasons before we came up, uh, has kind of waned a little bit, and it's what next for them. So this is a team we need to go and win against. Well, they've had a takeover and they've lost a lot of quite high level um, off the pitch staff. They've still got Daesh. Um, they do seem to have a little bit of money to spend. Um, Cornet, the fullback stroke winger from France, um, is you know put up a lot of money to try and make that one happen. Did we look at him? Um, it, he was somebody who was, I think, put to Orta rather than the, the other way around. Um, I think would have been on the list to some extent, but obviously it was Furpo that they, they went for. I think they'd, they'd look more at um, Romain Perraud over, over at, at Brest, I think, um, before before doing the Furpo deal. Uh, but he was the kind of player who fell into the, the bracket of you know, footballers who might potentially fit. Uh, but I don't think they ever got anywhere down down the line with that one. Uh, but there is it. You're right. It doesn't feel quite right over there. You can't tell where, where it's all going. You can't tell whether suddenly the uh, the people who run the club now are, are going to pull it all together, or whether or not this is going to all fall apart. And Dyche's been there for a long time now, and it feels as if that moment where they were kind of pushing on and pushing on and pushing on is gone. Um, and it does feel as if they're on the re on the retreat slightly. I've got a feeling he won't see the season out there, Deitch. There's a move in this for him somewhere. Um, maybe he's not that happy because there've just been one or two little signs that he's not altogether happy with what's going on uh, behind the scenes because they've got in Aaron Lennon, of course, haven't they, in, uh, in the last couple of days? I I, th I can see where you're coming from saying that and I think you might be right whether or not he moves somewhere else or whether or not it just comes to a conclusion because he's been there for, for so long and you know if things become stagnant and aren't moving then that's what tends to happen. I don't think when all's said and done, if Dice does leave at some point, any of this can really be pinned to him. I think he's kind of done more than his best with whether you like his football or not or whether you like him or not. He's done his best with what it seemed to be a very, very limited budget um, at Burnley. And I think they'll be very hard pressed to find a manager who does a better job for them. And I know we look at the away game there towards the back end of the season as evidence of what should happen on Sunday. But let's not forget the home game at Ellen Road was a difficult one. The circumstances were different, but the home game reminded me a little bit of uh, the game against um, Barnsley, the, the crucial promotion game that, that tipped Leeds over the edge at, at last, because it was on the back of the hiding at Old Trafford, and we'd had Bielsa's very, very long press conference before the Burnley game where he defended himself and his tactics and, and everything else had clearly taken umbrage in a very big way with what had been said after the, the result. So they needed a win against Burnley just to smooth everything over and just to, to get them going again. And the pitch was becoming horrible by that stage. It was it was problematic. But I remember looking at the stats afterwards for the number of passes that Leeds had completed into Burnley's box and actually the number of passes that they completed in the, the final third. And I forget the exact figure now, but it was absolutely minuscule. And for some reason, they just could not get going at all in that game. They just couldn't get a grip on it. They couldn't, they, they did hold Burnley off. But at no no stage of that game really were they able to get any you know any any real cohesion to the play, which was unlike Leeds and particularly unlike them at, at Ellen Road. But it was a it was an important win that one, not because it felt ultra critical at the time, but just because it, it continued the trend of last season of Leeds never getting stuck in a rut never getting stuck in a rut with, with bad results. And when they did have poor results, they tended to come in quite a short period of time and then something would, would pick them, pick it up again. And on the back of that, they went and absolutely destroyed West Brom. And I think coming away from West Brom with those two wins behind them, you thought they'll be fine this season. It felt like we got a little bit more Premier League streetwise between the two games last season. We learned how to play a little bit better and deal with what, what the cool kids call the low block because they do tend to sit deep and then hit the strikers early, don't they, Burnley, by the looks of it. And that's the extent of my tactical knowledge. Yeah, and I wonder this season how easy it will be to employ the low block against Bielsa because I think, particularly when you're at home, 
you get away with with it against him in the championship, or most clubs will, because there's the obvious argument of Leeds are the best side in this division. Um, you've you've got to play the percentages, and you've got to be sensible. You know, you've got to employ a, a system which is most likely to get your result. I think when you're in the Premier League, even though Leeds are a very good side and Bielsa is a, clearly a very good coach, there will be a lot of clubs or supporters of of a lot of clubs who will not want to concede that ground and will not want to sit there and say, look, we're not as good as these. So we, you know, the the team really should be sitting in and, and letting Leeds dominate possession. People expect their sides to get on the front foot, especially at, at, at home. And I always think that that's an advantage for Leeds. I always think as soon as teams start being aggressive with them and, and coming at them, it opens up the space that they're able to, to punish. And do you think the crowd may feed into that a little bit? because they might start to get antsy because they've not won yet this season. And if Leeds do push them back and the crowd feels like momentum swinging away from the home side, that we could take advantage of that. Antsy's become your word of the summer. I absolutely love it. I'm going to get Susie Dent to tweet that on um, on Twitter and uh, and explain explain what it means. But, it's it's but, yeah, better than Rodrigo de Paul. It, it is. It is. Yeah, we've moved on and, <laughs> and for the better. It, it's, it's a fair point. One of the things actually that was good about Saturday was it, it kind of answered the question of after so long without a crowd, how Leeds were going to cope and how they would react with backs against the wall. You know, in, in that position where Ellen Road can be wildly supportive and can help but can sometimes get horribly horribly tense and tetchy um at 2-1 down particularly when Everton were creating the chances for Calvert-Lewin that was that was like that that really questionable moment where this is either Everton are going to wrap this up now or Leeds are going to have a chance of getting back into it and the fact that they coped I think was a was a really really good sign so yeah it, it might well make a difference and Burnley haven't started well I, I think there'll be plenty of people in the crowd there who have been wondering for a little while now whether it's going to creep up on Burnley and whether it is going to be their time shortly. Uh, and they, they, you know, Leeds need points on the board, no doubt about that, but I definitely think Burnley do as well. Who starts on Sunday? What sort of a lineup do you expect Leeds to put out? And um, will we see young Somerville from the bench at some point? I'm surprised they didn't make the cut midweek, actually. Yeah, although Bielsa never really thinks like that, does he? It's never a case of, I'll, you know, give some of these kids a chance. It's all about have they earned it and his standards for earning it are very very high so whereas most of us would look at the game like that and think oh you know give Creswell a bash and play Somerville and yeah get Gilhard in, in the team and, and tried that last year against Hull well absolutely and you never get thanked for it if it goes wrong um, although the, the, you know you can strike a balance between 23s and, and first team players it doesn't need to be one one or the other um, but it was the right decision in the end and Leeds go through and I would like to think there's a, a cup run coming Urente 45 minutes on Tuesday which makes me wonder whether Bielsa thinks he'll be ready to start perhaps he needs a, a touch longer but I, I i mean no doubt that he makes leeds a better team um and as i say some of his distribution is phenomenally good you know pinpoint passes over at really really extended distances that rather than just being hit and hopes really do open teams up um i think they will be a better side over the season if uh, urenti plays regularly and i think if that right back position is open and everybody's fit i think he starts there um no doubt at all there will, I think, be another question over Rodrigo and something tells me he probably won't start at Burnley. I, I think Bielsa will be relatively happy with how Dallas and Cleek did against Everton. Um, he obviously has Forshaw hovering round again. He did say for what it's worth that Rodrigo had had a, a muscle strain before the Everton game. Otherwise, he would have started. He would have played him again. So perhaps, perhaps that is how it'll go. Um, but those seem to me to be the key positions because I feel that in a lot of areas... Um, the team is still picking itself. And Click, of course, scored there in that um, game at the back end of last season. So I think he found those little pockets of space and utilised them well. So you imagine Bielsa is going to be minded to put him in. Yeah, we we were we did a piece on Click before the season started after the Villarreal game, just saying what had what had decreased in his game last season. You know, the passes into the box, the, the creativity, and, and what he needed to find again. And he did feel far more influential against Everton. I didn't think he had a, a terrible game at Old Trafford either, actually. I thought there were little bits in there that, that were good from him. But against Everton, there was there was more of the old clique that we we're used to, particularly with the goals. And I still think he should have goals in his game, goals and assists, with, without any doubt. And if he comes back into form, then again, it makes Leeds stronger. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the consideration with the midfield at the moment is yes, they, they did want a centre mid and yes, it would be good to have one. But actually, there probably are ways in which the, the current group can improve for sure. Cleek as, as two examples. The thing that interests me with that, and I guess we're returning back to transfers here, is that 
He's going to be, what, 31 next summer? Forshaw's 30 and out of contract. Rodrigo is 30. We've got a lot of people hovering around 30. I'm surprised they haven't done a midfielder with a view to 12 months' time, to be perfectly honest. Well, we might have said on a previous pod, and I, this is my, my opinion, that it may well be that next summer in the transfer window, they need to go heavier than they have in this one. I understand the logic for not going heavy in this one. And, and I, I, I do try to make this point that it's kind of been telegraphed from a year ago that this wasn't going to be a dramatic window. Um, it was the expenditure last summer was basically supposed to cover both. The idea being that you're signing players who will be strong for that period of time, will, will make an impact for that period of time at least, and, and potentially get better as well. There are going to come... There, there are going to come days where you feel that you have to move on from Cooper or move on from Cleek, even ailing Dallas, they, they won't go on forever and you need to get the timing right. I think they would argue that they've got a lot left in them yet. Um, and, and to look at, at some of them, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. But it, yeah, it, it might be that next summer they, they need to they need to target the window in the way that they did first time round because every now and again, you are going to need a big outlay just to make sure that you, you do keep improving. And looking at the accounts, there was a lot of money went out on staying up bonuses last year. So presumably, while that will still be the case for this season, they won't be as, as onerous. And we've got all the uh, the post-COVID income that's going to help matters and the bottom line looks better and so on and so forth. Because Angus Kinnear, when we've spoken to him, has stressed that year three is when you are considered, if you like, cemented in the Premier League. Yeah, I've asked a lot about the finances because needless to say, when you're not signing players, the assumption is always that you don't have a lot of money. And... It's, it's not as if a club are ever going to say to you, look, we're completely skinned, but we're trying to pretend that we're we're not. But you can speak to enough people off the record and, and get enough honest opinions to know whether where they are. And I think financially they are in good nick. I think as, as happy as they could be given that they've had COVID behind them. Um, as Bielsa made clear, they, they don't have the money to stretch to some of the, the, the bigger deals that are out there. You know, they, they don't have the money to flog 25 30 million per player there are there are going to be points at which the budget is managed and, and the budget is is constrained but i don't feel that the problem this summer has been the absence of money i think it's been the absence of enough money to do players with the, the precise skill set that that Bielsa would want they, they wanted gallagher didn't get him they don't feel i would say that they need o'brien enough to pay what huddersfield want um and, and to stretch to the sort of eight eight million pound plus and when you start to look at the spec of players that Bielsa would have and, and who, who fit his requirements, some of them do become extremely dear um, and, and extremely pricey. So I, I suspect that next summer they might well be ready to go again, but that'll obviously be for them to say uh, and, and that'll be their decision to take. But it, yeah, two years in the Premier League, I think after that you, you, you can say that you are cemented, you are pretty secure there. And that then becomes the point where if you are going to target Europe and if there is, a, as Radrazani spoke about, a three to five year plan to get into Europe, you have to make that happen. If you're going to get into European competition, you are going to have to spend more. You are going to have to push push the squad. So you would like to think that if they can have a steady season this season, that they'll be, be set up for that. Cannot wait for Thursday nights in Azerbaijan. That's what football's all about, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I often think with this squad, if you think about how how hard they they're pushed anyway imagine mixing europa league fixtures in yeah back you into the mix bless them can't finish this show without asking you about um, i'm going to say daryl dyke because that's how i read it because i'm from yorkshire daryl dyke uh but it's d is it dk that's been mentioned is that how you pronounce it uh I, it's something like that yeah um <laughs> i i don't think so i don't think so they've certainly never spoken about a striker and all the messages coming out have been that it doesn't look like anything's going to happen unless at the last minute um, something major presents itself but the, the the position that was always the the up in the air one the, the potential target was the winger you know you you dan james you ryan kent um are they going to do it they're certainly not giving us that impression but i i played the angus Kinnear card at the beginning about rafinha so i will play it again now and see if something does materialize don't shoot me that's the thing is that i'm still not 100 percent convinced they won't even though everybody is saying no, no, we're, we're pretty much we're pretty much done. But there's that part of you thinks, but but are they just saying that just to throw us off the scent? This is why it never stops in the transfer window because even when you have explicit messages, and actually, I mean, it wasn't as if Bielsa said we will sign nobody else. It's all done, and it's not as if the club have said we will sign nobody else. But they've gone as close as they can to you know making people feel that they're probably done um, and the business is finished. But even even then, 
it's impossible. I mean, even when Rafinha was coming in last summer, um, I had people tweet me saying, do you think there's time for one more? <laughs> as, if, as if somebody else was round the corner doing doing a medical, because for as long as the window's open, there's always the potential, isn't it? There's always the possibility. Who Who's to say? Um, but if you add up all the messages that are coming out, and, and I would say that Bielsa does not play games with this stuff. Mm. You know, he, he would not be saying that if he if he genuinely thought there were two or three that were about to be completed. Um, he, he obviously has it in his head that the squad is a squad. Well, let me close out the show by lobbing a grenade your way then. Go on. So you can enjoy the uh, the backlash from this one when you uh, boldly make a prediction. If we were to do one between now and the close of the window, who do you think they'd do? If they plumped for a winger and they got somebody that Bielsa really likes and would take happily then ryan kent right okay so let the rumors commence and this one will be in the papers and the uh, the clickbait columns but this uh, is the, within, the, the within hours this is the problem you see i i'm i'm saying to you 100 percent. i don't see that happening i don't think that's gonna happen but um hey there's chance in everything of course there is um and finally then a prediction for turf Moor on sunday I, i've predicted a win for this one i think we're going to win it yeah i'm going to go with you on that and um my gut says as well that we might get a, a better performance over there you know like a more complete bielsa performance and um, i think this this could be the day and i think if that happens then actually people will feel pretty happy about where we're at as you said i take comfort in the fact we never got into a proper rut last season um and it'd be nice to go into this international break with a win under the belt it always comes i mean it, it's almost impossible to go through cycles in football without having a difficult spell but he also had them in, on occasions in the championship particularly in the second season it you know it's it and i think in though when certainly when they come around infrequently you you have to be prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt and and to give people time to work their way through it but as i say at no point in the premier league last season did it ever feel like creeping death you never felt as if it was all falling apart or, or going off the rails and um, and I still feel like they're in a good place Fingers crossed then so we're both going for the win for uh, for the weekend If you want to uh, catch up with us on YouTube we are on there now If you're watching this on YouTube hello you can get the audio version If you're listening to us check out YouTube that's how it works isn't it We, we should both. say as well that obviously Normanton's still going for a defeat even <laughs> though he's not here it goes without saying He'll, he'll be absolutely terrified yeah he'll be back uh, next week and say hi to us on uh, Twitter the Phil, at the Phil Hayes Show and subscribe to The Athletic. If you're not on there yet, you can read everything Phil's writing about and the Premier League, all the worldwide sport. 33% off at the minute on the full price of a sub at theathletic.com forward slash leads pods. And we'll speak to you next week.